the official Zoomcast of Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. He's an American guitar legend and musical director for The Conan O'Brien Show. Hear untold stories from Jimmy and his musical guests. They will talk music, its influence, culture, and future on The Green Room with Jimmy Vivino with special guest Max Weinberg. Welcome to the green room with Jimmy Vivino. That's me in the green room with you. <laughs> Tonight, my guest is world-renowned, famous drummer and band leader Max Weinberg, who is a personal friend and partner of mine that you may know from Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, or from Late Night with Conan O'Brien, or from The Tonight Show with Conan O'Brien, or uh, his, he had a really recurring role on Hawaii Five-O recently, which was hilarious. Uh, you check it out. Or you just may have run into him at the Windmill Hot Dog Stand in Long Branch. Very possible. Meanwhile, let's go and have some fun. There he is. Uh, hey. <laughs> look Jimmy, at this, hey. huh? <laughs> hey there, look at you. Uh, I'm you look good. Great. ZZ Top is calling. I, I know. ZZ Top or, or, or maybe your rabbi. I could. You, you know, know. You, you actually, you look like my great grandfather, who I do have a picture of, although his beard literally went to his knees. But. Oh, my God. Yeah, he was like a Talmudic scholar. But you look fantastic. It looks great. Well, I see you. Uh, you're clean shaven again. So well, you, I, you've been I, going I, on and off. Is there a beard there? I can't. I, you're, he's no, no, small. No, no, no. I, I am clean shaven. I, this has just happened because I've seen so many guys. And you were never one of these guys because when your beard came in, it was gray. And that was it, you know. But I've seen so many people I know my age that their, their, their beards are black. And I say, well, I don't, I don't want to look like that guy, you know, anymore. <laughs> right, right. You know? well, you don't. Uh, I mean, you and Dave Letterman have a thing going on. But... Yeah. How is I, I'm curious. I've never grown a beard that long. How is that? Food gets in it. <laughs> yeah. uh, you got to comb it. I talked to Gibbons about it, you know, and he said, well, I, I said, Billy, how old is that beard? He goes, well, I have this beard since I didn't have it. <laughs> so he, have it. Yeah. he when he started growing it, you know, in, in the 70s, I guess, or, or late 60s, he never shaved. But he he clips his on the bottom and makes it nice and square you know and uh and i i'm just gonna leave it for a while but you know i said to go back now and trim it back down and turn it dark brown again i thought that would be oh really no weird. yeah this so, is very distinctive this is very yeah, distinctive. I, I, it looks good on you got a great well look. i know I, I, it looks kind of like harvey brooks looks like this now he you know me we had the <laughs> he had the goatee he always had the goatee but yeah, but now since making Aliyah and moving to Israel, right? He uh, he has grown his beard like this. You uh -huh. know, he just let it go. Uh, you right. know, he looks right. like Zvi Schooler, who you might you might remember Zvi Schooler, who is hey, a yes, famous uh, Yiddish actor, right? Of course, you would know. Uh, let Let's get back to Young Max, okay? Let's start. I like to start with um, your parents' record collection, which is where most of us rummaged in the beginning and found music. Uh, was that true with you? Well, that's a great question, Jimmy. Uh, no, not at all, as a matter of fact. They're the only records, as we used to call them, vinyl, that were in uh, my house when I grew up from my parents were, a, uh, my mother was very, as you know, into Broadway musicals. So we always got the cast albums and there was a couple of Jackie Gleason conducts uh, LPs, and there were right. two Montavani uh, LPs. Um, my okay. musical thing came out really more because my mother was, a, as I say, a Broadway musical fanatic. So from the time I was about four to the time I was able to say no, you know, 12 years old, Every Saturday, we went to a Broadway show. So 
in those days, as you know, you grew up in that area. Yeah, you and I have had this conversation, but I think it's it's fascinating. Keep going because I want to hear some. I want to. I'm I'm going to say a show, and then you're going to let me know if you saw it. But go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So uh, they were very. Imp- they're still very impressive. But in those days, they used to have 40, 50, 60 musicians playing in the pit, and yeah. the sound was just unbelievable. Uh, so this is this is 1955 to about about 10 years till I was about 14 or 15, I guess. I started, till rock you know, and roll till, hit. Till rock and roll hit you over the head. Well, yeah. rock and well, the other thing was <laughs> there were a couple things that contributed to my early education was I had a pretty decent 45 collection because I started wearing glasses when I was in uh, first grade. And my glass guy, the optician, was in this old building in, on Broad Street in Newark. And on the first floor, and I hated going there, uh, you know, the guy was b- built, born in the 19th century, uh, uh, <laughs> getting yeah, new glasses. Sure. My reward was on the first floor was the office of a rack jobber. Now, a rack jobber, ah. you know, was the guy yeah. who would take 45s and um, distribute them to the five and 10 stores. And, you know, he'd have a rack. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so my, my sort of... Uh, you know, recompense for going to the optician was my mother would buy one new 45 for a dime and then he had cutouts and they had holes in the disc. So he would just give me a bunch of these records and I, you know, 45s, put them on the spindle and they were all, you know, they were eclectic. Every they drop, time. they yeah, drop, right? They, they would <laughs> drop one at a time. The, the spindle, uh, yeah. you know, which of course, you know, centering a 45 is a, a skill that is long lost to most generations. Oh, we've all done it. <laughs> we've all done it. We've all done it. To play somewhat in tune. But what was pretty cool about that was it was a very eclectic collection because he'd have pop, he'd have Joe Stafford, and then he'd have a Johnny Horton single. So yeah. I got all this. Yeah. And I was attracted to the country Western stuff. But I think there were several things that happened with me. My two older sisters both of my sisters quite a bit older than I am, eight and six years. And um, my oldest sister, I often describe them as my oldest sister was Rizzo from Greece. My (laughs) second oldest sister was Sandy from Greece. So um, Patty, my oldest sister was a real rocker and, you know, poodle skirt, ponytail, the whole thing, you know, born in the early forties. And they loved, they both loved Elvis and they knew about Elvis. And we were big as you and your family were, big uh, variety show uh, TV watchers, whether it was Milton Berle or Steve Allen or the Dorsey Brothers summer replacement show. So- And Lawrence Welk, Lawrence Welk. Lawrence Lawrence Welk. (laughs) uh, Yeah, yeah. Wherever there was music. And as you know, we've often talked about through the years, the many, many years we were so lucky because there were so many live musicians playing on television with this fantastic sound. Occasionally, very occasionally, you would, uh, uh, you know, actually see the off-screen musicians, the Ed Sullivan Orchestra, yeah. the CBS Orchestra. But yeah. um, so my influences came from a lot of different areas. And my when I was about seven, and I've told this story, of course, before, but, you know, I, 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 my cousin, when I was a little boy, like four or five years old, gave me a beat up little snare drum and sticks. And I could tap out like a, you know, a little marching thing. I play along to these records. And uh, one song I could play along to was When the Saints Come Marching In. And I, and the, the version I had, I don't know who it was by, but it had a big drum sort of Gene krupa e intro drum thing that 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 right i could i'll bet it was i'll bet it was the dukes of dixieland i'll bet you maybe it was it might have been you know yeah but anyway go ahead well i was uh you know in those days when we all do we still do i guess go to catered affairs it was a wedding or a bar mitzvah and the herb zane orchestra was oh yes zane world famous. herbie zane was uh the guy in essex county new jersey who he was jersey fame and my mother, my mother used to dress me in this really, she always dressed me really sharp. So I had this three-piece black mohair suit 
from an early age. I, you know, I was the only boy, so I got all the, you know, I got spoiled. <laughs> new stuff. <laughs> new stuff, yeah, exactly, mostly. And uh, so she went up to Herb Zane and said, can my son play drums with you? And he, he looks down at this, you know, kid with a crew cut and glasses and this three-piece suit. He goes, he plays the drums? Oh, yeah, yeah, he can play the drums. <laughs> He said, what kid, what do you play? I said, well, I can play when the Saints go marching in. This I got to see. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we have a young, and I get up on the drums, you know, and I was a very shy kid, like most musicians. And But when I got behind the drums, I was completely fearless. And I, of course, I was young. I didn't know what I was doing. I was only seven years old, but I could do that. Is that, 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 ding, 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 ding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, so Herb Zane, uh, he was very impressed. And, uh, you know, he told my mother, if he learns a couple more songs, he can come on my gigs. He didn't call them gigs. He called them his engagements. And, yes. uh, you know, I'll give him uh, 50 cents and he can play two songs. And they, they were, you know, so, yeah, I got encouraged from the age of seven to be yeah. uh, a musician. And, and a, a variety of things, as I say, happened since... It's your podcast, but we're talking about me for a second. No, no, but uh, I always felt you had like the bro I, I had the Broadway like thing. I yeah. had the Elvis thing from my sisters. I had those 45s on a spindle. And now yeah. I had a way to actually, you know, you make 50 cents in 1958. You could yeah. go a long way on 50 cents. So I yeah. played off and on with Herb Zane until I was about 14. And well, you know, I think I think I really think, Max, if I may in interrupt that the reason we are such good friends is because we grew up in different houses together. <laughs> you know, exactly right. like they were parallel, you a parallel universe, right? Me up in Patterson and you in uh, in the Newark area where you grew up, uh, th we had those big cities close enough to us yeah. to give us that. They give us that sort of, you know, urgency of we want to be there. We want to be in that city. You know, we, you go to Newark in the in the fifties and sixties. I it, oh, yeah. it was like going to Patterson. The same thing. They oh, were both okay. had loaded with theaters, and you know, I saw the Three Stooges play uh, at a theater. You saw the Stones in Newark, oh, which yeah. to me is still I'm so jealous. You know, <laughs> November seventh, nineteen sixty five. I saw the Stones with Brian Jones. I was at the Patterson Theater. I saw the Dave Clark Five at the yeah. Patterson Theater in 1965. They played there. I saw them also yeah. in '64 at what used to be called the Mosque Theater in Newark. It's now Symphony Hall. But people forget that these cities, Patterson, of course, was the center of the uh, clothing and textile business. Yeah, Newark yeah. Yeah, had yeah. an incredible music and art scene. Still does. Uh, yeah, you know, went through and the port. The port, uh, right? Oh, and then the Newark. port. Of course, everybody came through there. A lot of jazz. Down music. Neck, where Frankie Valley was from. Down Neck. <laughs> well, down Neck. You, you got to be from New Jersey to know, and of a particular age, because my mother, first time I ever heard that was my mother, Down Neck. And, and I used to play in the, that's the Ironbound section. Ironbound, that's the, yeah, yeah, sure. The Portuguese restaurants are there. Are there. Well, right. Yeah, it's still. the Portuguese restaurants. And my family was from the South Ward, which is over by the, uh, the uh, southern the southern side of Newark, just north yeah. of Newark Airport. That was the Jewish yeah. section. And, and Imperioli had the North Ward. The Italians were Imperioli was was the North. That's ward. right, the North Ward. And that's yeah. exactly right. And you know, we had you had Bloomfield Avenue. We had uh, Chancellor Avenue. And, and the, uh, the funny thing is too that you that that we we grew up in neighborhoods. You know. Uh, where, where when you know when people went in those days for real estate, you know when we whenever we moved somewhere, I noticed hey, there's mostly Italian kids living around me, you know, and it was just it, yeah. it kind of was the way towns were built in those days. I don't think it was, uh, you know, that nobody complained about it back then, but you yeah. know we always had neighborhoods. I, I just remember that, you know. Was, well, there were uh, neighborhoods, and and you know our neighborhood. Uh, the, I, we moved out there, out of there shortly after I was born. But it was um, the, the, in the middle of Philip Roth territory. Uh, actually, my mother was a teacher for forty six years at Weequake High School, where Philip Roth went to high school. Philip Roth, I'll tell you a funny Philip Roth story. So, 
Philip Roth was a counselor at my father's summer camp. You know, that was his business. He ran a, a summer camp in the Poconos. So about a year ago, um, my manager gets a note from a woman who was putting on at the Newark Museum a huge Philip Roth retrospective because he's from Newark. And someone donated a bunch of letters of Philip Roth. Among them were letters to his parents. And in one of the letters, it uh, refers to uh, 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 one of the kids in his bunk, his cabin. Uh, you know, uh, he was a counselor to six or eight other to kids, little kids. He goes, that Weinberg bastard, <laughs> he says in this letter, right? So she writes Mark Stein, my manager, who, who then sends me the letter, is that you? Well, Philip Roth was a counselor in uh, 52 and 1953 at my father's camp, uh, Pocono Highland camp. And I wrote her back saying, well, highly unlikely because I was only about a year old, but yeah. it sounds like it was my cousin Lewis, who at that <laughs> time was about 11. And Lewis <laughs> was, you know, our family's version of, I guess, Eddie Haskell. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or a Bart so, Simpson kind of kid. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, my, he was the oldest of, of five first cousins on my father's side. I was the second youngest. But in any case, yeah. uh, those were great days because, you know, they had Hertz recording. You could go in and you, you could make a record for $15. However yeah. long it took you, you could go in there and you could actually make, come out with a piece of plastic that yeah. had... You, re you know, direct to a... I went into a booth with my brothers in Asbury Park. You remember this place, too. It's somewhere there on the, you know, that the steel... Not, it wasn't called the steel pier, but what was it called? The pier, right? The pier. Right. Oh, uh, the boardwalk. Yeah, the arcade. It was called the arcade, I think. Yeah. Somewhere in the arcade, there was a booth where you could go in, and me and my brothers, we, 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 the three of us, jammed into the booth, you know, and sang uh, um, My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, you know, and, and then it spit the record out after yeah. you were done. You take it home with you to acetate right away. Well, and yeah. There, there was a, not much different than Elvis, you know, not, not much different than Elvis's first record, you know. Which uh, well, is, that's exactly, essentially the same thing with, you know, Sun Recording Service. Herx was like that. On the corner of 42nd Street and uh, Broadway, there used to be uh, a place called Playland, where they had yeah. telephone booths where you could go in the telephone booth and make a record. And it had a green label. And I went in with, I, I must have been 10, and I still have it, of course. And I sang <laughs> yeah, the Ricky Nelson <laughs> song, It's Late. It's Late. We got to yeah. get on home. It's Late. We've been gone too yeah. long. And I still have it in my high little squeaky, you know, pre puberty. Uh, 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 voice but it was a totally different time and you know like your you and your brothers yeah, uh, you yeah. Know, your father was a musician my father was a uh, a very talented violinist who never made a career of it so there was always yeah. music and um they weren't allowed had, to you know, were they yeah I think to go to your point jimmy on how you even you and i connected was we know the business of show as joe delay yes. would say show yes. business and for your listeners, that is something that's probably not uh, either well-known or that apparent, but I can visualize us working, even from the first time we met, having this common reference ground that yeah. was very unusual for rock music, essentially rock musicians to, to come up that way, you know, through the appreciation. But, you know, you, you and, and, and Jerry and Floyd were like modern day vaudevillians. And uh, that's quite unusual uh, to have that background of real, what they used to call legitimate show business. But we both have this, uh, this one thing that we had such strong support from our parents when they knew that we were serious about doing it, you know, and that, and you, as you did too, you know, your mother, obviously, you know, and father were, were encouraging enough for you to keep going. You know, and so, so, okay, then what point do you first play with some other kids? You know, well, where does that, where does your ba basement band happen? Well, I, uh, I'll tell you exactly the, uh, uh, and I can visualize it in my memory. I had already played with adults 
before I ever played with people my own age. So when I got into fourth grade, you could, uh, you could pick, you know, you could pick an instrument and I actually wanted to play saxophone and I was good on the drums, but it, it, it always appeared to me, well, the sax players up front, the drummer was in the back, right? Yeah. And I love DJ Fontana and I love playing the drums, but I said, all right, I, you know, I was always even then a, a little bit of a businessman. I want to, I want to be the guy who pays the guy. And that was yeah. in Herb Zane's case, he was a trumpeter and, and, you know, or a sax player. So, but I had braces. So I couldn't play, uh, you know, on my teeth and I couldn't play the saxophone. So uh, they put me on the drums and th- I was the only one. So in those days you either did songs in two or yeah. three, boom, chick, boom, chick, or boom, chick, chick, boom, chick, right? Yep. Yeah. So I did the right hand with a big round bass drum and the left hand to snare. And a bunch of us got together. My friend Douglas Katz, who's still a friend of mine, lives in San Diego. Uh, he had a, anybody who wants to come to his house in his father's den and play music this Saturday. So we, a bunch of us go over there. And, you know, we kind of didn't know what the hell we were doing. But there were like three trumpets. Uh, you know, there was a tuba. Uh, yeah. There was no keyboards or, or, or acoustic bass or anything like that. And we made noise communally. And yeah. I guess that, that was fourth grade. So that would have been 1959, I think, 59, yeah. 60. And I'd already yeah. had a little bit of experience, you know, playing with Herb Zane. I didn't have a drum set, you know, because I'd always go to <laughs> play on, on his drummer's set. But I, yeah, had right. so, <laughs> yeah. I had the little snare drum that, you know, my cousin gave me. And... Uh, you know, and we were playing, you know, that band turned into, with my friend Douglas, a little Dixieland band. Uh, yep. You know, a piano, a bass player. I have pictures, of course, from that. Uh, of I have a of the piano player. <laughs> Leaving it out, about six months ago, I get a, um, through my management, I, I got these pictures that I never saw of me with those guys taken by the piano player's brother. So, and they're in color. Right. I mean, who had yeah. a color camera playing? Uh, there, there's a shot of us playing w- with Herb Zane. Right. And at uh, I guess it was a seventh grade dance. But but what's great is you see my little blue Kent blue sparkle pearl drum set. So, yeah. you know, I've been playing a lot. And then, you know, I, I guess what happened to me, like happened to the big thing for me was Elvis with DJ in terms of, wow, the drummer makes a lot of noise. I like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, then I got sidetracked and the sax couldn't do that. So by the time I was in, you know, sixth, seventh grade, uh, I was, I wouldn't say I was working steadily, but I was going out and making, you know, three or four bucks, you know, every couple of weeks. And it was better than and bad. there was some pretty was- good, th- and that was, and that was the error too, of a lot of guitar instrumental surf bands. Uh, so, you know, of course the drums, you know, the, the, the Mel Taylor influence must have been huge for you, along with Sandy Nelson's record, right? Uh, well, yeah. Sandy those was, must have been big for you, those yes, records. Yes, Sandy, Sandy Nelson made a string of records. You know, of course, his hit, uh, Let There Be Drums. Uh, uh, and he was an interesting drummer because he was, uh, he was a big band drummer. And when you listen to those records now, they're very charming. Uh, you know, he, it was him and a guitar player on a lot of that stuff. I'm going to jump ahead because we did mention Bruce's name and, you know, we got to get to the meat because you and I can build up to, you know, we could keep talking up to 1969 for another hour, you know, about everything we did and saw and everything that got us to where we were as musicians. I think it's very similar. The shows we saw, the records we bought, the clothes we bought, you know, everything that was involved with, with it. I think we both did where and when, were you aware who this kid was from Freehold and what he was doing and at, and how did you get an audition with this guy? Well, if you can imagine over the last 47 years, I've been asked that, but I don't know if I've ever been asked it. So, uh, point on, um, (laughs) our good friend, our mutual friend, Joe D'Elia and I had done a, a keyboardist, great movie score, had done a bunch sure, of we had a band together. <laughs> we had a band, yeah, Killer Joe, right? You and I and Joe, but That's go right. ahead. 
And yeah. in fact, he probably, oh, I think it was Jeff Koala who introduced us in a studio. You were making karaoke records at the time. Yeah, that's and right. I'm very was. impressed with yeah. your ability to, uh, uh, assimilate. to, move, uh, to well, to assimilate, uh, to move around the studio, you know? Uh, I, didn't yeah. know I didn't know who you were. And uh, and then our circle started, so I'll get to Bruce. So I was playing with Joe in a band with Peter, a guy named Peter Yellen, who was a singer. And we sure. were they sort of based in the Nyack to Pan uh, area of uh, New York, yeah. right outside the city, you know. And um, we had this five piece band we were called the High Point. And was it Danny was, Tone was, in that uh, band? <laughs> Danny <laughs> Tone or Danny Al Tone Zip was in that band? <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> a guitar player. Uh, Jack yeah. Kraft was a keyboard yeah. player. Love him. Joe played keyboards. Uh, I think Gene Bosha was in that band. Yeah. Um, uh, either Gene Bosher or David Snyder. David Snyder was a bass oh, player. Oh, remember Swan but, Snyder? Yeah, yeah, Snyder. And, uh, yeah. and we were together for a while. And so Peter, this is this early summer of 74. I had taken a road trip to, in May, I drove some a guy's car. You could do that in those days. Akon Auto Transport. I had no money to go to California, so but you could drive somebody's car. So I get this guy's car in Great Neck, New York, and it was a, a Mercedes 280 SL. It was a hot nice. car. So of course, yeah. I'm 23 years old. I'm going out to California to try to meet people. So I, you know, I drive straight through three days. So you get two weeks to get there. So I have the car for like 11 days and I'm driving around LA like a, you know, a hot shot trying to meet people. <laughs> and actually the guy whose car I drove was, was in the music business. That's a whole other story. I come back and I'm kind of energized playing with High Point. And uh, we did all sorts of gigs. We did cruise ships. There's pictures of us on, on cruise ships and stuff. Um, Peter Yellen, the singer, somehow got invited. He knew Louis Le Havre, who lived up there, who was Bruce's engineer at 914 Studios, which is on Route 303 and exactly. in uh, Orangeburg, I think. or that yeah, area. Yes, yes. And I don't even know if it's there. It was a gas station. And... Uh, he went to the bottom line in July of 74 and came back to rehearsal a day or two later, just raving about this guy Springsteen. I mean, and I said, yeah, Springsteen, you know, uh, I did a show with a college group about four months ago. I said uh, it was a pickup group. And this guy, this friend of mine from college, Jim Marino, was kind of like a... Uh, uh, you know, a James Taylor singer songwriter kind of guy uh, uh, put a band together to, and got this gig in the cafeteria to open as for Bruce. So I didn't, I never heard of Bruce and this was before Peter Yellen. I'm backtracking a little bit. So yeah. during our set, we played to open and it was literally in the cafeteria. The stage was made out of tables. It was really low rent. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I didn't know anything about Bruce Springsteen. Uh, at the time, you know, that band was, we were into traffic, tall, you know, more, a little sure. more jamming, a lot of jamming. Uh, and during our set, which was about 35 minutes, I started to feel sick. And as it turns out, I got tonsillitis later that night. So I, only, uh, so I stayed for the first song and, and I didn't know it. Dave Sanchez comes out by himself, sits down at the piano and starts playing the introduction to New York City Serenade. And it was really long, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. About eight minutes long of this wild piano, fantastic piano stuff. So at toward the end of that, I left. So I left there sort of like, ah, oh, you know, this is Bruce Springsteen is this you know, black piano player, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I love this. And, and so, because I it wasn't my scene at all, and I didn't, you know, I didn't really yeah. play much at the shore a little bit, and um, so then this Peter Yellen comes back from this bottom line show, I think it was in July of '74, and says, you know, this is this is the new direction, you know, like in a hard day's night where the art director says three weeks, this will be the new direction, and, <laughs> he, and right. he was pushing. So then. Joe D'Elia picked up a copy of uh, the village voice that had that ad. And it said, you know, you know, Peter came back raving about Springsteen. They knew about Bruce Springsteen uh, and the E street band. 
It never came up in conversation because they were friends. They lived up there and they were friends with Louie and Brooks Arthur, the engineer who I believe you know. Yeah. Uh, know great well. engineer who did classic stuff. He became a producer. He owned 914. So, and he lived up there. So I wasn't in that scene really. Uh, I, I did actually did a session there once back in, with Joe uh, and Danny back in Dusty Springfield, but I digress. So anyway, Joe auditioned, Jack Kraft, the other guy who auditioned. Yeah. And you know, they, they, and I'm like, well, I'm playing in Godspell, the show. Yeah. I'm going to Seen Hall University and I'm playing with the band on weekends. And, you know, I could make a club date at, by 10 o'clock. And in those days, you played generally from nine or 10 to about three, the Orangeburg yeah. Club, you know. Yep. And, uh, <laughs> Red Rail. <laughs> yeah. And I was I was kind of living between my parents' house and Joe D'Elia's father-in-law in that in Rockland County, his house. Yeah. And uh, in the basement. I lived in the basement on a cot. And uh, uh, it's funny when you think back. I mean, we're going back to I was 22, 23 years old. So uh, about three weeks later, Joe D'Elia says to me, you know, now I know who Springsteen is. Hadn't seen him. I hadn't even heard his music. Uh, he says, this Springsteen is look, still looking for a drummer. You know, you're, you're a good rock drummer, man. You ought to audition. So I'm like, look, and I'm looking at the band because the band was pretty good. You know, everybody's auditioning for this other guy. Well, I might as well, too, you know. So it had, you know, I saw that you've seen the ad and it's had Bruce Springsteen, East Street Band, Columbia Records and and I had a phone number, which I still remember, 212-759-1610. It was Mike Appel's Call office. that number, folks. <laughs> Call that number. I don't know what you'll get now. So I called up, and, uh, you know, you, I, by that point, they had heard, like, 50-something drummers. Oh, yeah. And uh, they hadn't found, you know, there were a couple of guys. It turns out there was a guy from Bergen County who, after I got the gig, he, he was like the front runner until I came along. And he thought it was his gig. And for about 10 years, he was really obsessed with me, this guy. And I won't mention his name. You may run into him. But um, and he was you know, apparently a very good drummer. But I was about the 58th guy, I think, 58th or 59th. And, you know, yeah. because of my Broadway background and my all this sort of, you know, jobbing drummer background, I, I wasn't music for me was not an escape from the establishment because yeah. my father's business was going bad. We all had to go out and earn money as kids. So yeah. <laughs> music for it was a way in for me to the establishment. I wanted to do whatever I could to get in. I wasn't rebelling yeah. against anything. I wanted to be like the guy in the bow tie and the tuxedo playing the club dates, you know, in my mind. So, you know, whatever gig came along, I played. And everybody, as Bruce tells the story, I go up and it was at the old SIR on 54th Street. 250 West 54th Street. And I was playing Godspell. My audition was on Monday night. I had an old Slingerland set that uh, I had covered in uh, uh, orange uh, rap myself, yeah. right? And we were, I was in the pit <laughs> band. And so I didn't, the audition was Monday night. The show was dark. So I went up there. I got a bass drum, snare drum, and a hi hat. Nothing else. Because it said Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis. I said, okay, yeah. well, that's basic backbeat stuff. So I come in. And also, you know, it was a good thing I did because the elevator was broken and I had to carry it up four flights of stairs. <laughs> the little drum set to uh, the studio. And uh, the drummer's lot in life. Yeah. yeah you know, and, but it was a small little set. So, you know, I could kind of stuff it inside each other and carry it. A cab know, set, we used to call it. Taxi cab set. Yeah. It was kind of that. Yeah. Just kept it in the yeah. car. When I, you know, but I was playing gospel, so it was at the show. So I go up there and it was really an ugly looking set of drums, but, and I didn't know it at the time, but, you know, Bruce's first impression was, you know, this guy, first of all, the guy who came before me was packing up his drums and he had, you know, eight Tom Toms. <laughs> if you came in with that kind of drum set, <laughs> you could have been, you know, the best drummer in the world. You could have been Jay Weinberg, <laughs> my yeah. son. But well, he, yes, we'll get to that, hopefully. Yeah, but well, go ahead. I didn't know, uh, he, you know, I'd said Chuck Berry to Jerry Lee, so I figured it was pretty basic rock and roll. And at that time, people weren't really doing that. You know, it was, you know, Slade, no. Zeppelin, you know. Yeah. The, the kind of thing Bruce was doing was not in vogue. People think now it was. It really wasn't. 
And uh, he was about to be dropped from Columbia Records. He had two spectacularly unsuccessful records, the first two records. Well, he was, so, write, he was writing operas. He was writing operas at that time. Yeah, pretty Each much. Each song yeah. was an opera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you, you spend your whole life up to your first record thinking about your first record. What do you do then? And um, anyway, I, we sat down to play. It's pretty basic. Johnny, be good. I could play that. Get to a third or fourth song. And one of his, his big showstopper at that time, instead of Rosalita, was uh, an up, a very up-tempo shuffle of Let the Four Winds Blow by Fats Domino. Uh, Fats Domino. It had a lot of cuts, a lot of accents. And I was really good at taking direction and working with all those legitimate bands, right? So, you know, I'm playing the shuffle fast. Young kid, you can play fast. And I got the shuffle going on the bass yeah. drum. Boom, 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 you know. Yeah. Like Vinny, kind of like Vinny Lopez. And uh, at this point, I hadn't yeah. heard any of the music, his music. But, you know, I could jam. I was really a good improviser. So we're playing and I'm catching most of the accents. And then at one point, uh, this was about, you know, 45 minutes in, Bruce goes like this, like stop, right? And he makes it real obvious, stop. And he said, he said, this was 20 years later, I asked him, why did you choose me? Because I never know. And he said, well, it's interesting. There was a moment. This is the moment. He goes like this, stop. So I stopped. He goes, that was a test to see if you were paying attention. Not me, but everybody. You did it with everybody. Yeah. If you missed it, I did it again. I wasn't happy about it, but I did it again. If you missed it a third time, I didn't care how good you were, you were out. Because you were, yeah. you were into like playing with your eyes closed. And that's not what yeah. he wanted. I didn't know this guy from Adam, right? Didn't know anything about him. But so, so that was pretty easy. Stop, you know stop playing and you know what was really impressive was the way Clarence Gary Talent and Danny Federici were keying in on him you know as you know Jimmy the hardest thing in a band is to get the focus of you know particularly if it's you, you could tell where the energy the energy was coming from all of them but they were following him like you know glue it was really impressive yeah. there was a long pause now I didn't know anything about Bruce and he was playing guitar as it turns out, he really wanted to put that, he didn't want to be, he was a hot guitar player, but he didn't want to be known as a hot guitar player singer. He wanted to be a front guy. That means putting down the guitar and doing the sort of show business stuff, right? The kicks and the, so, you know, with our background, your background, my background, uh, a dancer kicks, you hit a cymbal, you do an accent, you do something, some business. So there was a long pause and then he throws his arm out like this a James Brown kind of thing. And I hit a rim shot. That rim shot is what got me in the band. Yeah. That, that I was following him. That I was out of all the guys, there were like 63 guys who auditioned. I was the only one who hit the rim shot. And he, and he said to me 20 years later, when we, during the period we weren't playing together. Uh, and I asked him about it. He said, you were the only guy who didn't, who, who, who wasn't afraid to go for it, who it didn't confuse. You went for it. And for me, it was natural. Somebody, you know, you're, you're frozen and somebody goes, boom, you hit a rim shot or you do an accent, you know? And it, it, I didn't know it, but it perfectly lined up with his desire to be a front guy and do these, these sort of, you know, Sam and Dave soul review stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, you're right. Uh, all bands, uh, to be a band, to me, the definition of a band is chemistry. And it's not about being the greatest at anything. Uh, it's about being cohesive and, and willing to, to me, to put up with anything to both make the music and to be in a band. It's communal. Uh, the East Street Band's interesting because, you know, as a band, there's probably, without Bruce, there's probably, you know, four songs we could play uh, together. So the spark, of course, is Bruce. And so, and it's, you know, yes, it's and the E Street Band, but the E Street Band is, um, it's a vehicle for Bruce. It's not a separate entity. And it, where a lot of bands are more organic, where I always liken it to a chessboard, where, you know, you've got your players in certain areas, right? The E Street Band yeah. is like a flying wedge. <laughs> that's that's yeah. how I look at it. Like I don't think yeah. Gary Talon and I 
have ever talked about locking in. There's no discussion. No. It just, you know, and very often, if you take apart the music, we're not locked in. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it, to me, it's been very interesting to listen to E Street Radio when I'm driving and you'll hear these old concerts in clubs or whatever, where we were set up virtually in each other's laps. Yeah. And then you'll hear a, a show from an 80,000 seat stadium. And we're not quite as tight in certain yeah. aspects because I think the visual distance, there's a, just a milli of a millisecond delay. And so the East Street Band, if you take it apart internally, there's a lot of moving uh, dynamic elements uh, at the same time. And the, the deal with the E Street Band is we don't play with each other. We play with Bruce. And, yes. and it's, it's something that's very, very different about the, the compositional makeup of that band. 